signing up for Mastodon, fake AirPods, and ChatGPT's effect on jobs. This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter to keep you up on all the latest from Mac Voices. Watch or listen to Mac Voices straight from your email client. Sign up at macvoices.com slash newsletter and stay up to date. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this is part two in a three-part Mac Voices live panel discussion. This time, we start out with a new way, and hopefully an easier way, for you to sign up on Mastodon, and what difference it makes. Let's go back and let the panel do the talking. So the next thing on the radar, um, Mastodon has apparently tried to ease the process of signing up for Mastodon by offering you the option to go with a default server or a, uh, a, a let you pick your own server. This, I, think, I mean, go ahead, Mark. I mean, does this take away friction? I don't know. It it, it depends. It depends on you know how how big their infrastructure is. Because I can see this creating a tidal wave of demand, and it melts their server, and everyone walks away with a bad taste in their mouth. You know, but it, it certainly is a problem with it because uh, I've signed up. Oh, I don't know. Whenever it was, uh, whenever what, uh, two days after I saw you know, Webb Bixby uh, said that uh, he got a Mastodon account, you know, I got one too. Um, but it's that old, uh, you know, Yogi Berra saying, "No go, no one goes there anymore." It's it, you know, you know, because it's it's hard to find people, hard to see dialogue. You know, it's has way more friction than just interacting, engaging on Twitter, even to this day does. So. I saw this late in the day, didn't get a chance to try it because I'm I'm hopeful it works, but uh, uh, until I have some more experience with it, uh, I can't say more about it other than sign up and finding and building community on Mastodon is uh, a very frictionful, uncomfortable process. Mark, I agree with you. And you had some of my th- same thoughts is, you know, if Mastodon's going to create a default server, if you will, then how much, two things. First of all, how much does that put a strain on that server and a strain on Mastodon? But does it detract from the federated nature of Mastodon for okay, people so that, that want that? Jeff? Mastodon.social has always been the de facto uh, server because that's the one that's run by the guy that created Mastodon. And, um, and, uh, you know, concerns about it, can it hold up under the, the load as it gets, uh, as more people are joining Mastodon. Um, you know, just like any service, there are times where it has a little bit of trouble, but they rebound quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that can be a thing. It's so far, I haven't seen it to be a serious problem or even anything more than an inconvenience. Um, and uh, and it's very easy to switch which Mastodon instance you're on. You know, w- w- once you're in the system, if you find I out there's something that you just like lost better. probably 97% of users out there by... Yeah, making- but the thing is, they're not going to switch. Once you're, once you're in, you're just in for most right. people. For the people where it matters, that last 5%, they can switch whenever they want. Now, what I think would would be a cool thing is to have a system that all of the the apps uh, can hook into that's part of Mastodon proper, where uh, you go to sign up and it says, we'll help you find the, the, the right server to connect to. And you get like five questions where, you know, just ask you general things about uh, about what you like. And then it says, okay, this sounds like, like the server for you. And you just join. And uh, well, I, I, mean, know, I don't think there's any basis for doing that. The thing is, um, <clears throat> you know, unless you're wanting to do something that, say, Mastodon.social isn't going to allow you to do, in which case you'll probably have a trouble finding any server that's going to let you on. Oh, yeah. You know, what's... You know, what's the difference? Uh, you know, it's pretty clear 
you know, Eugene isn't going to make this setup if he's not confident that, uh, you know, he's got a track record and the team there has a track record of, you know, being pretty cautious. So if they're offering this, I think they're, they're confident that they can do it. I do think that what you said about switching at any time, that's not really true because none of your posts switch. Uh, that's a good um, point. Posts your, don't your switch. Posts, your, po- your posts are all left behind. And I, you know, there's talk about resolving that. I, I don't think that can ever be resolved because the problem is that moderation is done at the time posts are done. Um, so, like, if they allowed your posts to all move, then let's say you started off on some, you know, 4chan type Mastodon server and, you know, posted a bunch of stuff that, you know, and then you want to move to techhub.social and all your posts come over. Well, you know, there's no way they can moderate, you know, 4,000 posts that you're importing. Uh, So, you know, how would they, you know, police that? So in that sense, leaving the post behind would make sense because they, they can't be moderated after the fact, uh, or we um, presume. Um, oh, oh, there's another reason why, too, because the posts have an absolute URL. So when you you know link to a post, it's at that URL. If you moved it to a different server, all the break links the would break. All right. Well, that makes sense. Okay. So so you, you can transfer to to different instances as often as you want you're just leaving behind yes. your post yeah. and if that and, and, matters and they, to you then don't it, switch it, yeah if that old server well w- one case you know i think the, the one case where it's a, you know definitely could be a problem is what if that server goes out of business okay so like if you just transfer and that server's still there well your old posts are still there you know you can still people can still see them um and in fact that old server will point people to here where you are now uh, there's a forwarding thing. So, you know, people that were following you will now still be following you, even though you moved. So unlike with email, if you change your email provider, um, then you've got to tell everybody, you know, manually, here's my new email. Mm-hmm. With Mastodon, you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. When you when you switch, it does it automatically. So everybody following. So in that sense, you can move and you don't lose your connections of, of you know, your community. Mm-hmm. But your po- but your posts don't move, and if that server goes completely kaput, then those posts are gone, and then the referrals gone too. Well, to be fair, if Twitter goes completely kaput, all your posts are gone. That's true. I you know I'm a Mastodon fan. I'm you know, uh, I I way more positive than than Mark on it, um, and you know I think this is probably good. Because, you know, the, the federated thing is just too complicated for, for most people. They don't care. They're just like, get me on. And, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Brian, you're probably the one with the, with the, um, the most recent Mastodon presence. How, how are you finding it? And knowing that you have a bit of a tech bent because obviously you're here, um, you know, did, do you feel like this this produces friction? Would would you be comfortable saying hey to someone, hey, join me on Mastodon and here's how you do it, and just let them join the the default server? Yeah, I think you know, just sending them this article is great. I mean, it just has a direct link. It tells you exactly what to do. It's got the graphics of what it looks like. Um, for somebody who's less tech oriented, I think this is perfect. Um, yeah, and I, and being the fact that it didn't take away the other options where you can sign up elsewhere. That's great. You know, and I think maybe there needs to be a greater um, publicity. If not, that's already, and maybe it's there or not that maybe mentions, you know, that if you do switch, then the, you know, the posts don't switch with you. Um, That would be the only thing maybe to let people know and make sure people, people were aware of, but um, yeah, I think it's great. I I think, I think, I think the biggest problem with Mastodon is in the real world, almost nobody's heard of it. And, you know, I have no problem recommending it, but, you know, almost always outside of the tech community, people are like, Masta, what? What, you know, what are you talking about? And, you know, and just, they just immediately are like, that sounds, that sounds nutty. I, you know, 
sounds complicated or without well, even time, just, well, just, just, just the name was just the name just the name mastodon yeah I, you know that's right but i mean i'm i'm you know i'm not saying that can't be overcome i hope it can be overcome but um you know yeah it somehow needs a marketing campaign of some kind i do hear you know it is somewhat being more popular than it used to be even out you know it's like you were mentioning you know in the tech community it's there but uh, i was listening to a podcast recently that that brought it up and it was not a, a tech oriented podcast. And I was, Oh, that's, that's kind of cool. You know, they're mentioning Mastodon. So yeah, it's getting out there. You know, I, I, you know it, it's definitely increasing, but I'm now like, I, you know, I don't want to tell people my Twitter contact anymore. I used to, you know, meet, when I met people in the real world, I'm like, well, you can connect with me on Twitter. And, you know, so now I'm trying to do Mastodon, but you know, nine times out of 10, I get what, you know, are you on Twitter? Like yeah, I am. It's okay. like it's a, it's like if you met somebody thirty years ago and you were out of area code, you you know, it's like uh, you might as well not give them your phone number because yeah, but at least they knew what area, area code, code yeah. was. <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah. know what a social network is. So Jim, the the way that's played out for me because I, I I I've had similar interactions. You know, people say, "Are are you on Twitter?" And I say, "Not anymore. I'm on Mastodon." And I either get what's Mastodon or oh, I've heard of that. And uh, and if and if it's someone that that is approaching me saying, uh, I've heard of Mastodon, I want to join it, what do I do? And I say go to mastodon.social and sign up. And I don't even tell them anything about federated servers, blah, blah, blah. I just say, go to mastodon.social and sign up. And it takes them like a minute and they're done. They're like, okay, great. Thanks. So far, I haven't met anybody out in the real world that's heard of it. Or when I mention it or like, oh, how do I sign up? They just like, no, can't I reach you on Twitter or Facebook? But to be fair, I live in Boulder and yeah. um, so I, I, I fully accept that I'm in a very unique demographic. And so I I, I'm sure there's lots of people like, like that, that out there. You know, I'm not saying there aren't a lot of people, but it's still fringe. Eric, I'm, I'm curious if I remember correctly, you're someone who had one uh, Mastodon, you were on one Mastodon server and then you switched. Yes. Did you, uh, I mean, did it work as advertised? And I understand we, you lost the posts, but that's another question I'll ask in a minute. But uh, did you find the experience problematic? Did you find it really techy or was it pretty seamless? Well, I ended up doing it in sort of a weird way. So, and I ended up adding like an additional account after that. So I didn't actually get rid of my other account or transfer it. The, and the issue I was having with the account is that there are too many people on the server. And it was glacially slow. And and it would speed up for a while, and then it was glacially slow. And it was slow at night at times when I was using it. So I picked a server that at night it wasn't glacially slow. Um, but I had I had groups of people I followed on the original server that weren't the same people I wanted to follow on the other server. So I, what I ended up doing is I kind of split my subject matter up. So I have my tech account that's just tech. That's all it does, doesn't do anything else. Um, occasionally there'll be a hashtag I'll follow that gives me you know other, other things to read. I have another account that is basically social. It's got gardening, cats, dogs, scenery you know and and depending on what what city i'm going to be in i follow that city's hashtag and and there's no work related stuff it's all relaxation and de-stressing um and so i basically ended up kind of breaking my accounts up by subject and who i wanted to pay attention to and i could do it with like sets of tags that i kept resetting but that was too much work and with the um, uh, with the new apps now, you can just click and switch between accounts. So depending on what I'm doing, I pick one account or the other account. And as long as I've got hashtags on my postings, I can even follow a hashtag from one of my other accounts so that my information shows up in two spots. 
without having to post it twice, which, you know, is sort of annoying to people. Um, and it, it mostly has worked. The few people that are following me on the tech side probably don't want to see all of my social posts. The social people might or might not want to see, but I'm doing it because I want to and I don't care. So, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't truly annoy the tech people that only want to see tech stuff. I can, you know, it, so that has worked for me. Um, and, you know, yeah, at some point I might decide, yeah, I'm only going to be in one spot or I'm only going to be social. I'm not going to do any tech stuff. And then I might combine. Um, but the, it took me about three months or so to kind of figure out what server I wanted to be on. And there, there weren't, I didn't have any posts that I would have cared if I lost the posts because they're still there. I could still search for them. I didn't need them to really follow me because I didn't really start doing interesting things until after that time period. So I gave myself enough time to kind of get used to what people posted on that particular server. Was it active enough? Could I find things? Um, there's some servers that as I get super busy, they don't hold posts active for very long. So, you know, um, uh, tutorial videos or whatever would fall off within hours instead of being active long enough for me to read them. You know, so I just kind of went back and forth until I got kind of a good mix. And, you know, following hashtags made a huge difference because that kind of crossed multiple different servers. Um, and and so I, I, I've really been pretty happy. It's It's been active, but not so active that I feel overwhelmed. And, you know, when I want to focus on a particular topic, I just shift to the account that's that topic and I can ignore everything else. Um, I want to give us a little time to some comments in the chat room. Uh, well, first of all, I got a I got a text message from someone listening that's not in the chat room that said they live in the real world and they've heard of Mastodon. So that's that's, a, that's <laughs> well, there good. You go. I'm not saying there's no one. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, clearly there's what 10 million Mastodon users. So there's there's got to be a lot of people in the real world that's heard of it. But <laughs> it's it's definitely you know I I, I would you know I, I wish there were more because I you know I don't want to connect with people on Twitter anymore. Yeah. Um, so going way back in the conversation, though, um, Guy Searle, who's also couldn't be with us tonight, but he's in the chat room, too. Good to, good to have you there, Guy. Um, he pointed out that it's what that engagement the la or lack of is why so many loudly left Twitter and then quietly returned. Now, Jeff, you threw in a response to, I guess, all of this, uh, saying that you've had more engagement on Twitter excuse me, on Mastodon than you were getting on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But isn't it fair to say that that was pre-Elon-oriented meltdown? The, so my engagement on Twitter uh, pre-Elon purchase was, uh, um, actually, I'd say at this point, on par with what I have on Mastodon now, with substantially fewer followers um when when elon bought mastodon i mean it was like overnight just watching my engagement tank to the point where where um even before the apis are broken i just wasn't even caring that much to even go look at twitter anymore because i was i was just talking into a black hole and uh yeah, but on Mastodon, even um, when it, it was, well, even when I started just initially interacting, um, engagement just seemed to happen. And so I think part of the problem with, with engagement is, uh, is who you're following, which of course totally makes sense. But, um, I think some people is uh, or, or some people are just not finding the right groups to get the engagement that they want, and uh, and I can see where that's really frustrating. And then you want to go try something else or go back to what you had before because at least you knew how that worked. Um, uh, but I think that's a problem you can have on any social platform. Agreed. Agreed. 
Um, next story. Um, this is another one that's just interesting, I think. Uh, this is from MacTrast, um, that over a thousand fake AirPods Pro worth $290,000 were seized at Dulles International Airport. <laughs> I, you know, what can you say? I mean, it just that somebody went to the trouble of counterfeiting them and then unfortunately got caught. They would have Are they made... sure they were actual counterfeits, or were they just Samsung earbuds? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Samsung got burned uh, with that once already. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a good point. But uh, as, a, as a professor emeritus of, you know, uh, from uh, that I know, uh, it says, you know, where there's successful life, there will be parasites. So I think that about sums it and, up. And look at this planet. There are humans all over it. Your oh. point is correct. Mm-hmm. Wow. That is, um, thank you there, Jim. That, that's, or, uh, it's Mark. That's a really optimistic view on things, I think. Interestingly, it says no one was arrested. I wonder if they're waiting to try to get bigger fish before springing into action. Well, it's possible that. And and to be fair, I have not read the story. So if there's no arrest, what that tells me is when this went through customs, through routine checks, someone's like, dude, these aren't real AirPods. And uh, and so the whole shipment was seized. And the uh, the people that sent it and the people that were going to receive it were not there when this happened. So no arrests have happened. Yeah, I think so, but you'd think they would like wait and see who showed up. I'd I'd like to know how they were how they determined that they were fake. That's that's the one thing because yeah. I mean there's a picture which is frankly is quite probably a stock photo. Um so of course. You know, you I'm have sure to that's a stock photo. And, and, and Jim, yeah. my guess is the reason you don't just sit and wait is because this is a pallet that was going to be loaded on a truck and taken somewhere else. And uh and so they just seized it where it was before it was loaded up and and went off to wherever they should have thrown an air tag on it. <laughs> Counterfeit one, <laughs> right? Did, there was, did you see the story recently that apparently in Australia, I think it was, there was a program where you could uh, throw away your old, your your shoes and they were going to be recycled, um, and uh, and they ended somebody, up in a landfill in China. No, uh, but uh, they they ended up in like markets in India or something like that. I did see that somewhere. Uh, yeah, and and they used air tags to they they embedded them in the shoes, and you know they actually were able to go and go to the market and find them there and. I think they bought some back, <laughs> but it was like they were supposed to be turned into roads or something or, or no, uh, it was supposed to be material for playgrounds. And, you know, I think it was a program that one of the like shoe manufacturers sponsored and it was all, you know, this big publicity thing that we're going to recycle these and they weren't. Hmm. Um. So this one I kind of thought would be the biggest one of the night uh, coming up. Um, this is one, though, that that Brian found. Um, and Brian, I'll let you talk a little bit about it. But it's discussing which jobs will be most impacted by chat GPT. Yeah, I found this uh, article uh, from Visual Capitalist. Um, and uh, it was interesting. It, it goes in there and it talks about um, it has a nice little graph. It kind of shows, you know, out of 10 workers, six will have at least 10% of their work tasks impacted by GPT technology. And two of those workers will have 50% of their work tasks impacted by GPT. And then it kind of goes in um, which types of jobs are more and less exposed to, um, you know, possibly uh, having your job disrupted. By that type of technology, it goes into specific fields, um, 
and then, which is kind of interesting too, it kind of goes into like, what are some recommendations about um, government focus of what they can do to kind of um, prevent some of the ills that would happen with all these people losing their jobs. And uh, I thought it was really interesting. Um, it generally talks about um, a lot more um, jobs that are more hands-on. Uh, obviously not being impacted as severely with the uh, chat GPT technologies, uh, but those types of tasks that are more repetitive in nature or um, uh, things like it, it talks about mathematicians, writers, authors, uh, interpreters, translators, all sorts of different types of jobs that would be severely impacted. And it was, just, it was, it was a nice way to kind of present that data. And um, yeah, it just kind of shows how much is at risk. You know, it's not 100%, but to me, this list looks a lot like the same kind of jobs that would be a, have been affected by uh, off, offshoring or what? It, no, that's not what it's called. What's it called? Jobs that moved to India? Uh, outsourcing. Outsourcing. This looks like, you know, the same, the same suspects as that to a large extent degree which makes a lot of sense um things that you don't have to be physically present for so maybe people in, in india need to be more more concerned so I, before we go further with this i want to throw another link in the in the chat that this was from the journal of uh of american medicine um, that Apparently, doctors' offices are using ChatGPT to respond to patients' inquiries rather than having the doctor themselves do it. And apparently, everybody everybody's loving it. the The information, and and obviously, there's not been a study on all the accuracy, but routine queries, um, ChatGPT is just fine, and. You know the doctors don't have to do it. They don't have to. Spend, they can spend their time doing things that require more skill. So I, I just I saw saw a link here between these two, and I Jim, Jim I think your point is is pretty well taken. Um, but I also feel like there's some discussion here to be had because we heard some of these things when spreadsheets first came along, and we heard some of these things when word processors came along and, you know, and on and on and on. Every time there's a technological leap, small or large, somebody's going to get their jobs adjusted in some way. You know, there are very few, very few people working on horseshoes anymore. What's the name? There's a name for that job. Few tele, not very many telegraph operators. Blacksmith. Blacksmith, yeah. So long ago, Jim, can't even remember. I don't, does anybody else, I mean, is this, should we be as I alarmed as some of this stuff thinks? I'm might? already being impacted by this. Um, so I'm a professional writer. Uh, I freelance for a bunch of companies. And I have um, um, a couple clients who have said, you know, instead of writing content, we'd rather just have you edit what we're generating out of uh, ChatGPT or one of the other um llms and uh, and then of course they they want to pay a fraction of what my time is worth for me to just edit something that they had a computer generate jeff you know i love you but i gotta ask is do you see this as making your time less valuable for a potential client than it was a year ago it makes my time less valuable for certain clients so if if you're a client who who think who, who for whatever reason and it could be a legit reason uh thinks that the uh the ai generated content is sufficient for your needs then i don't have value to you anymore um if you're someone that feels like that is not going to to meet the needs of your business, then I still have that value. I'm kind of surprised well, that someone that would think that AI was certainly at the current stage would would be sufficient. 
would have ever hired you. You'd be surprised. Well, no, I would have thought that they would have already like outsourced or, you know, something like that. Well, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of really crap content produced by humans and have there been is. for a long time. Uh, but um, you know, in some cases, it can be a thing where companies have been paying me or other people to do what I do, and now they're saying, "Well, we can in ten minutes, fifteen minutes, whatever, we can generate this whole thousand word article, and it looks good to us." And uh, and so now we don't have to pay all this money to have someone else, a person, write what we what we're liking. So, uh, for some other companies, it's a matter of they couldn't afford to pay for the content, and now they can get content. And uh, yeah, so those are companies that wouldn't have, wouldn't have ever approached me anyhow. Mark, you want uh, to? Yeah, I was going to say that you know a uh, number of thoughts come to mind. Uh, the first is, and I think touching on uh, different interpretation of something Jim said. You know that yes, maybe these are the jobs. A couple of years ago, everyone's fearing they're going to be going to uh, to India. So I, I think to me that really indicates okay, there's maybe a category of jobs where they are they are replaceable. You know, either by lower skilled human labor or by lower skilled uh, you know AI uh, and uh, you know machines. Um, but I, I think maybe more importantly, a di- different way of looking at this is. You know, apart from you know what whatever 10 15 20 percent of crap jobs that may just get replaced think of this as a tool that can really augment you know uh people's efficiency uh and ability to uh, perform uh, within their job i haven't had a chance to look at this jama article that uh you've sent out but uh I do imagine that you know for there are probably very many routine medical questions that can be uh, successfully answered by this. You know, diagnostically, uh, I know of uh, you know several uh, several MDs and several researchers who are cautiously optimistic that uh, either whether whether it's ChatGPT or some other uh, machine, you know, can be properly uh, curated, if you will, so that it could provide better. Uh, diagnostic information because right now chat gpt um spits out stuff that sounds oh so good or like jeff says oh it's a, it's, it's acceptable qu- content we can't tell the difference but it's wrong and for that you still need a human in the loop uh, to take uh, a look at it but uh, there's many things uh you know all sorts of uh, diseases you get when traveling infectious diseases that most docs, they unless they're in a big city, they're not going to see that. But uh, this is a way that uh, you can uh, you provide you know, better uh, better quality healthcare. So I, I think it's more a matter of jobs evolving and changing, and it's sort of like uh, people getting used to using uh, you know a spreadsheet. You know, I think uh, that providing uh, ultimately enough power or word processors provide enough power and you know lease all sorts of uh, uh, you know, new uh, effectivity uh, and all sorts of new, new jobs were created. Yes, some go away. That's unfortunate, but I think uh, you know, the, the beauty of uh, you know capitalism and innovation is you new higher value activities and jobs uh, come along, and uh, that's where you need to uh, swim to and and position yourself. Next time on Mac Voices, the panel talks about an artist who's leaning into ChatGPT rather than fighting it, and what large language models have to do with Hallmark movies. You can't wait, can you? That's next time on Mac Voices. I'm Chuck Joyner. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page. And get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices, or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices.
Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.